Hey there and welcome back. We're now on sub element. Bravo of element two of the technicians exam. So let's go ahead and get into the meat and taters of this. Question one is how is VHF UHF transceivers reverse function used? And the correct answer is to listen on a repeater's input frequency. So on this radio, if I wanted to listen to re to somebody on reverse, well, why in the world would I even want to listen to somebody on reverse? Well, in the event that you, someone might be scratchy coming off of a repeater, then you might check the reverse to see if you can still hear them. And if you can, it means that you are closer to them than they are to the repeater. So then you might be able to say, hey, let's go to a simplex frequency. I can hear you better there. So on each of your radios, there's a specific way to listen to reverse. On this one, honestly, I've never used it, so I don't even know how to do it on this one. Now, on my mobile rigs, yes, I know how to use the, in, in, uh, the reverse function on those and the one that's in the shack, because sometimes I have to run a local net. Every once in a while, you have to go listen on reverse to see, hey, can I hear them? And everybody in the area might do that because who knows? If you're at the edge of the, uh, the repeater and its transmit range and somebody is outside of that, somebody might be able to relay information back in. So that's why it's nice to be able to listen to a repeater's reverse function and the uh, repeater's input frequency. So question two says, what term describes the use of sub-audible tone transmitted along with normal voice audio to open the squelch of a receiver? And CTCSS is short for Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System. And that Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System, like our repeater, is 141.3 hertz. Now, you might think, well, gosh, I'm human. I can hear that. Well, subaudible is mostly talking about the fact that our radios don't really, FM is not going to produce much below 200 hertz anyways. But it's also filtered at the frequency, uh, filtered at the repeater so that it's not retransmitted. And that tone you don't pick up here, but this radio puts out a, that, that continuous tone and if it matches the repeater's tone and offset, then you're able to use that repeater. So when you use a repeater, it's good to know the offset. And the offset from the repeater's frequency gives you that offset frequency. And then you usually will need to know the CTCSS tone as well. Now, there are some repeaters that don't use them. And that all goes through a coordinating entity. Okay, so which of the following describes a linked repeater network? Your correct answer is A, a network of repeaters in which signals received by one repeater are transmitted by all the repeaters in the network. And this might be used to hold an area-wide net, or it could be used in disasters or in an emergency where you need to have access to more amateur radio people. So there are lots of ways to link repeaters over the air is just one of those ways. Which of the following could be the reason you are unable to access a repeater whose output you can hear? Your correct answer is all these choices are correct. One of them could be an impo improper transceiver offset. So your repeater offset, if you have it positive and the repeater is expecting it to be negative, it's not going to hear you because you're transmitting on the wrong frequency. B, you are using the wrong CTCSS tone. Remember, that's that subaudible continuous tone. If you have the wrong tone, you may not be able to get to that repeater that you can hear. And the third one is called DCS, and that is a digital code squelch. And it's a little bit different because digital would be the use of ones and zeros, and it has a specific pattern that the repeater might expect. So your answer for these are all these choices are correct. Let's go down to question number five. What would cause your FM transmission audio to be distorted on voice peaks? And I'm sorry if that voice peaked. 
it means you're talking too loudly. If, if you get too close to the microphone on your radio, you're going to distort the microphone. And most likely, there may be a gain setting for the microphone. And this radio can also accept an external microphone. Lots of radios can accept all kinds of microphones. You have to check to make sure that you keep your, your voice inside of what's called the pig pen. And that is not the proper term, but your ALC, you want to make sure that it's within that frame. Otherwise, it's going to cause distortion. It might cause um, some spurious emissions. And I know these are some new terms to you, which we won't get into right now. But don't talk too loud. The best way to use your handheld, and now I have a dummy load on mine because it was not on, but I did something earlier. But you want to hold it level this way, plumb towards your face with the antenna pointing straight up because most FM and VHF, UHF are vertically polarized. And you just talk normal like this. This is W1RCP, listening, monitoring. And so that will get you the best transmission. If you've got your handheld right up in your mouth like this, it's just gonna sound like a kid's toy and you probably won't be understood. Plus, you're going to get your hot breath all over it. Okay, question six is, what type of signaling uses pairs of audio tones? The correct answer is DTMF. Now, if you have a somewhat modern but not a cell phone telephone, and you use those numbers to type in, press one for English, Disponible en el español o prima dos. Uh, when you push those buttons, they're putting a dual tone, so two tones, and it uses multiple frequencies to have that, uh, that specific sound. And then at, on the other end, there'll be some kind of processor that can process and say, okay, this, these two frequencies, they must have pushed a number two. Uh, if you ever want to hear it, go find you an old landline phone, like legit plugged into the wall, and uh, call somebody first. Because <laughs> you don't want to just go push a buttons. You might make a, a foreign phone call. But you can hear those tones on, on there. You can sometimes hear them depending on what kind of radio you use. If you can listen... Uh, on another radio with headphones on, and you put them into a uh, simplex frequency, you can listen to those dual tone multi frequency uh, tones. So, DTMF is the signaling that uses pairs of audio tones. How can you join a, a digital repeater's talk group? So you need to program your radio with the group's ID or code. These may be published on a website somewhere. Program your radio with the group's ID code. That is the talk group. So group is your hint for that one, group's ID or code. In order to use that, you need to know that information. Which of the following applies when two stations transmitting on the same frequency interfere with each other? The stations should negotiate continued use of the frequency. And that's no matter where you are. If you're an HF and you run into somebody else, propagation changes, and next thing you know, you hear somebody else on frequency. If you can negotiate, negotiate. If they can't hear you, somebody's got to be the bigger person and just mosey on. Uh, if you're on two meters, 146.52 is the calling frequency. You might have to say, hey, uh, Alpha Bravo 2 Charlie Delta Whiskey 1 Radio Charlie Papa, let's go up 5 kilohertz. Or, th uh, yeah, 5 kilohertz. So instead of 146.52, let's go to 146.57 or 14655. And you, you negotiate and then you make that happen. We want to keep international and national and local goodwill going. Question number nine, why are simplex channels designated in the VHF UHF band plans? Let's say that I'm just camping. Here's your answer first, remember, I'll be camping. So stations within range of each other can communicate without tying up a repeater. If my friend Eddie 
is in the next campsite over, there's no reason for us to need to communicate through a repeater. Most of the time you can't anyways, because they're off in the middle of nowhere, but so we can communicate with each other. We might designate a, a simplex channel and uh, 14652 is a good one. You might get other campers that may be ham radio operators. 14655, that's the South Georgia, uh, uh, South Georgia, North Florida calling frequency. And you may have one in your area that's probably the same. VHF doesn't travel far. So on simplex, maybe three to five miles uh, if you're real tall from person to person. And so that is stations within range of each other can communicate without tying up a repeater. Question 10. Which Q signal indicates that you are receiving interference from other stations? That is QRM, and you'll hear it sometimes QR Mary. Um, QRM is, you can kind of think of it as man made interference. QRM, and that is what, that is the Q signal that you're receiving interference. That way you can figure out uh, the other station, and you can figure out do we need to stay where we are or do we need to move? Question number 11, which Q signal indicates that you are changing frequency? Now, sometimes I think it's kind of silly to say QSY, but it has a, a very large meaning. QSY is really fast and you can understand it. Now on CW, if you do Morse code, QSY is a whole heck of a lot shorter than saying I am moving frequencies. So QSY is what indicates you are changing a frequency. On the repeaters on Tuesday night, sometimes we'll talk to people from clubs from the next city over. And sometimes we'll go to their net and hang out for a little bit. So I might say, this is W1RCP. I'm going to QSY to so-and-so's repeater, frequency 147.285. That also means that you are leaving the frequency, so hopefully nobody else calls you. You're making your move. We have two more questions left. What is the purpose of the color code used on DMR repeater systems? So there's a color code, which is kind of silly. I'm colorblind. I need the color name too, but it must match the repeater color code for access. I've never used DMR, so I don't know much about it. But if you Google DMR repeater systems, you can get all the information you want to know, locations of where they are, and how to access them. But the answer for your test is it must match the repeater color code for access. And the last question for Bravo in sub-element B, that is element 2 for the technician, what is the purpose of a squelch? function. The squelch function is really nice, especially on FM. Now on uh, your HF, you're probably not going to use squelch. Uh, if you use CB, sometimes squelch is nice if you're within range of who you want to talk to and you don't want to hear all the static. But this radio has a squelch function that I can spin until the ambient noise drops out. And you can switch between it. If I want to listen for a weak station, I might keep it here. If I want to not hear that junk, I can leave it there. And of course, since I'm connected to what I call my dunce load, which is just a dummy load, um, that keeps me from being transmitting all over the world or even in the area uh, while I do testing. So, the purpose of squelch is to mute your receiver audio when a signal is not present. If a signal comes in that's strong enough to go over the hump where I set that squelch, then that audio comes through. Alrighty, so we've completed part B, uh, sub-element B, of the second element of the technician exam. And I hope that this has been both helpful, informative, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one. This is W1RCP at 73.